this list in our number 10 spot, we have Heraclitus of Ephesus. Heraclitus of Ephesus was an ancient Greek philosopher who helped push the notion that the universe is in constant change, as well as the unity of opposites, where the universe is a system of balanced exchanges. This is all fine and well, but where things get troublesome is in his own personal life. Heraclitus was a misanthrope, and his dislike for humankind led him to having long stretches where he was quite isolated. He would wander through the wilderness alone, surviving on plants and other things that he could scavenge. In the end, he came down with a pretty terrible and painful illness called dropsy, which is an accumulation of fluid underneath the skin. Doctors were unfortunately unable to help him, so he took matters into his own hands. He decided to cover himself in cow dung under the belief that as it dried, it would draw the moisture out from under his skin. This could have been a genius idea, albeit super gross, but things took a very, very dark turn. Covered in the dung, he laid out in the sun to dry, but the dung created a body cast and it left him unable to move. This inability to move also left him unable to shoo off the pack of wild dogs that ended up surrounding him. So, unfortunately, he was eaten alive. I guess I can understand why this one may have just been left out of history class. In our number nine spot today, we have Kurt Gödel. The Austrian-American philosopher and mathematician Kurt Gödel lived from 1906 to 1978, and he made quite a name for himself. Being compared to the likes of Aristotle and Einstein, he is best known for his incompleteness theorem, which was a very significant mathematical result. He was obviously very successful and found himself teaching and educating a younger generation, but similar to who we just talked about, his personal life is where things got quite dark. When he was six years old, he had a case of rheumatic fever which left him quite ill for the rest of his childhood. This led him to first being pretty preoccupied with his health, and unfortunately this turned into hypochondria, which then led him down a path of complete paranoia. He ended up having an irrational fear of getting poisoned, so to avoid this he would only eat food that had been prepared by his wife, who also had to taste it beforehand. Sadly, his wife was hospitalized in 1977 for six months, which obviously left her unable to prepare food for him. I'm not exactly sure why he couldn't just prepare the food himself, but during this period he refused to eat, which eventually led to him starving to death. In our number eight spot today, we have prohibition poisoning. I'm sure most of us learned about the prohibition at some point in school, which of course was the outlaw of the consumption of alcohol, which was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol by the US government from 1920 to 1933, but it is just as well known that this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming consuming alcohol, it was just done in sneakier ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that is definitely less well known is something that government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. Basically, they poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. And not just poisoned in a way where the drinker would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. In our number seven spot today, we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up knights, imagining that he was St. George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was very obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep from shattering. But then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean he was totally abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances bricked up. 
Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number five spot today, we have Bikini Island. Bikini Island is located within the Marshall Islands, and it once was the home of around 170 islanders. In 1940, the US president at the time, Harry Truman, ordered that the military test their nuclear weapons in the case of a future where they would be deemed necessary since World War II had just ended, and people were, of course, feeling very concerned about what the future would hold. Since Bikini was located in a place where ships and planes didn't normally travel very close to, unfortunately it was the spot chosen for this testing site. The residents of the island were asked to vacate for the good of all mankind and to end all world wars, to which they of course obliged under the impression that they would one day be able to move back. After this, the testing began, and in 1954, the US military detonated Castle Bravo, which is one of the most powerful weapons at 15 megatons. There were 22 other weapons that were detonated on this island as well, so it's safe to say that this place got a ton of nuclear activity, which left it with extremely high levels of radiation. This left residents unable to return for much longer than anticipated, with the first returning in the 70s. But of course, shortly after these poor people moved back, they realized that the island still had totally unsafe levels of radiation, making it still unfit to live on, which has left it still uninhabited. In our number four spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. During his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At the time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well-known events during his rule was his pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325, and it spanned an estimated 4,000 miles, and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 60,000 of his men, all wearing Persian silk, along with 12,000 slaves who each carried four pounds of gold bars, and he brought heralds who had golden staffs, along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo to the royals to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal in Egypt and it took decades for them to recover. That was kind of just a whole mess. But like we talk about like Napoleon and Alexander the Great and all the things that they did and I've literally never heard of this guy before. And he's like one of the best conquerors, most successful conquerors of all time. Seems suspicious. In our number three spot today, we have the hostage crisis. In 1980, America saw Ronald Reagan win the presidential election over the former president, Jimmy Carter, but there was a crisis going on that was taking the attention of Americans everywhere. The Iran hostage crisis is well known in American history, and it began on November 4th, 1979, when 52 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage after a group of militarized Iranian college students took over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. The 400 144 days these Americans were held hostage is something I'm sure a lot of Americans learned about at some point or another, but the release of the hostages is what sometimes gets a little more murky in the history books. The hostages were released on January 20th, 1981, which was the day that Reagan was inaugurated. There were people who believed that the hostages were released because Reagan was simply just more powerful than Jimmy Carter. Basically, what I'm trying to say is that Reagan received a ton of credit for the release of the hostages, but truthfully, it barely had anything to do with him. The Carter administration had been attempting to negotiate with them for months, but they hated Carter because he had provided aid to the former monarch of Iran and had also failed an attempt to rescue the hostages before. So while they certainly were released on inauguration day, it had way less to do with Ronald Reagan and way more to do with them just absolutely hating Jimmy Carter. In our number two spot today, we have internment camps. This is something that might be more well known than I think it is, but in my Canadian education, it wasn't something we talked about at all, which is kind of shocking. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the 
worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century, and the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit, with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of this same kind of atrocity. It is very surprising to me that this is something that isn't discussed more often, as it of course is something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese-American community for decades to come. In our number one spot today, we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievably terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So, like I mentioned before, in 1911 there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day, which is absolutely horrible. After more details came out about the incident and how the terrible working conditions were mostly to blame for the amount of lives that were lost, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically got off scot-free. If you want to know more about this fateful day, the amazing podcast My Favorite Murder by Georgia Hardstark and Karen Kilgariff has an episode that does a wonderful job covering it. The episode is number 189 entitled What Wonderful Luck. It is crazy, and there's a lot going on. Starting off this countdown, we have the Kiss nightclub fire. Back in 2013, a college student named Jessica DeLima Roll had plans to attend an event at a local club called Kiss Nightclub. That night, as she was getting ready though, her boyfriend begged her not to go. So she decided to not go. That night, the club caught on fire after a malfunction with the band's pyrotechnics. 238 people lost their lives. Jessica survived because of her boyfriend. But sadly, five days later, when she was picking her boyfriend up from work, she got in a car crash with a truck. She was instantly killed. Sadly, she was only able to escape death for a short period of time. In our ninth spot, we have the wedding rings. A couple of years ago, a man and his fiance went out ring shopping for their wedding. His bride-to-be took him to a store to show him the ring that she liked. They also had plans to go to the store directly across the street had they not found one at this current store. But the man fortunately did like the ring and decided to go with their first choice and head directly home after. Well, 20 minutes later, they learned that the jewelry store across the street, the one that they were about to go to, was robbed. This resulted in a shootout between the robbers and security guards at the store. A number of the customers had been shot. This would have been them if they didn't find the ring that they wanted. This is just all too freaky for me. Coming in at number 8, we have The Flight Home. According to Jeffrey Reddick, the creator of the Final Destination series, he got inspiration for the film from a real life story that happened in 2012. So he was on his flight home from Kentucky when he read an article about a woman on holiday in Hawaii. The night before her flight, she received a call from her mother warning her not to get on the plane the next day. Apparently, the mother had a terrible premonition that the plane was going to crash. So to appease her mother, she decided decided to change her flight to a later time. The next day, she found out that the plane that she was supposed to be on had crashed. Which is basically how the first Final Destination movie starts. Isn't that wild? Trust your intuition and gut instincts, folks. Moving on to number 7, we have the double plane crash. In 2007, a father named Bud Warren and his daughter Phyllis Riding were out flying in their handcrafted plane when the engine caught on fire. Thankfully, they survived after making an emergency landing in a hayfield. Four years later, the two were involved in another plane accident. This time, they weren't able to escape. The two were out flying for an air show in Texas when their cockpit started to fill with smoke. They tried to make an emergency landing, but this time they were unsuccessful. 
Sadly, they both passed away after their plane burst into flames. In our sixth spot, we have Air France Flight 447. In May of 2009, Italian woman Joanna Ganthler and her husband were vacationing in Brazil and had booked a flight to Paris on May 31st. Their flight was going to be with Air France Flight 447, the plane that crashed into the Atlantic resulting in 228 deaths. But that day, her and her husband missed the flight sparing their lives. Eventually, they decided to fly to Europe a day later and then rent a car to go home. But as they were driving, their car swerved into the opposite lane and collided with a truck. Joanna sadly passed away. Her husband did survive, but with serious injuries. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Gunther Link. Gunther Link was a devout Catholic who in 2009 got trapped in an elevator. He was terrified and the whole time he was praying to be rescued. After his release, he decided to go directly to his church to give thanks to God for saving him. But as he was praying, the church's heavy stone altar fell on him and crushed him instantly. His body was found the next day by people attending mass. Moving on to number four, we have the deflected bullet. This next story is about to blow your mind. So one night back in the mid 80s, serial killer Richard Ramirez, otherwise known as the Night Stalker, paid a visit to a woman named Maria Hernandez. He stalked her from her car to her apartment and then followed her upstairs. When she got upstairs, she turned around after hearing someone behind her. That's when Ramirez fired a shot at her. But Maria raised her hands up in instinct and the bullet ended up hitting the car keys in her hand. What are the odds of that? She literally was saved by her car keys. Afterwards, she pretended that she was dead and managed to escape from Richard. She only had a broken finger. In the end, it was her testimony that helped lock Richard up for good. I still can't believe that. That what are the odds that our little tiny keys it just blows my mind. Coming in at number three, we have the cab. A couple of years ago, a man in New York City needed to hail a cab to get to his destination that night. After he hailed the cab, he realized that he left his wallet in his hotel room. So he told the cab that he would be right back and went back into the hotel to retrieve his wallet. But the cab was impatient, so he took another client instead of waiting. When the man came back out of the hotel, he caught another cab. When they were driving along, he saw that the cab that he was about to get in was overturned halfway up the block. Turns out that a drunk driver ran a red and hit the side of the taxi. Both the taxi driver and the customer lost their lives. This was going to be him had he not forgot his wallet. In our second spot, we have Jessica Redfield. Jessica Redfield was a sportscaster and blogger from Texas. In 2012, Jessica was at the Eaton Center Mall in Toronto when she decided to grab a burger and get some fresh air by eating it outside instead of inside the food court. Three minutes after Jessica left the mall, a shooting occurred. Had she not gone outside, she could have been a victim in this incident. Although Jessica survived this shooting, a month later she was involved in another one. This was the shooting that happened at a theater in Colorado during the screening of A Dark Knight Rises. Imagine that, escaping one tragedy just to be shortly involved in another. And in our number one spot today, we have Daredevil Bobby Leach. I swear, this has to be one of the craziest stories of all time. So Bobby Leach was a well-known daredevil. He's done a number of stunts, including going over the Niagara Falls in a barrel, which he survived. However, in 1926, while doing a tour in New Zealand, Bobby Leach died after slipping on an orange peel. Yes, an orange peel. This dude survived going over the falls, only later to die from a fall. Now, it wasn't the fall that killed him immediately. He actually suffered a leg injury from the fall and his leg later became infected and required amputation and he died after complications with the surgery. But still, that just blows my mind. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Frayn Selleck. Frayn Selleck is both the unluckiest, but also maybe the luckiest man to ever exist, and his story could totally be an action-packed thriller. So the first instance of his insane unlucky luck comes from 1962. In this year, he was in an accident where a train derailed and subsequently went into a river. Sadly, most of the people on board passed away in the incident, but he survived with only a broken arm, and he was also suffering from hypothermia. 
hypothermia. The next incident happened just a year later on his very first plane ride ever. Well, he was seated next to a faulty door and ended up being pulled out of the plane and somehow miraculously landed in a haystack and survived. While the plane went on to crash and 19 others who were also pulled out of the plane and sadly their fates were not the same. He survived a bus he was on going into the lake, he survived his car's fuel tank exploding, and just to top off this unlucky luck with some real regular luck, the first time he played the lottery, he won 600,000 pounds. He is also extremely generous, as it is said that he decided to give most of his winnings away to his friends and family, but he did keep a little for himself in order to complete a personal passion project. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Robertson family. The Robertson family truly has one of the most interesting stories I have ever heard. The family decided to take a boat out for a while as a way to experience more and learn some exceptionally valuable lessons. The family, consisting of a husband, wife, and four children had decided that they would stop at each port along the way, which meant that they had pretty limited supplies on the journey with them. While they were on their boat, a group of killer whales ended up attacking their boat, which caused severe damage, and the boat began to take on water. At this time, all they had on board with them was food enough for six days, a small little dinghy, and a lifeboat. Somehow the family survived for 28 full days using the lifeboat and the dinghy, but also by eating and drinking rainwater and turtles that they had hunted and collected. The family ended up being rescued when they were found by Japanese fishermen. In our number 8 spot today, we have Kelly Peters. Okay, so this story starts out with Kelly Peters, who is a California mom and the president of the Parent Teachers Association. One day she was pulled over by the police and they found some devil's lettuce in her car. I'm calling it that because I can't really say its real name and if you don't get the reference then that's exactly the reason why I can't see the word. Anyway, so the officer finds this jazz cabbage and Kelly starts swearing she's never seen it before and has absolutely no idea where it came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah Kelly, we've all tried to use that excuse before. Except it turns out it wasn't actually an excuse at all. So Kelly worked at the school in an unpaid volunteer position and there was some sort of minor incident that led to another student's parents, Kent and Jill Easter, to seek out and try and ruin Kelly's life. Again, for this super small, super minor incident where the Easter's child was just late for pickup and Kelly said it was because he's slow. That's literally what happened. So first, the Easters sent the principal a letter asking that Kelly be fired from her position at the school that was again a volunteer unpaid position. When that didn't happen, Jill filed a restraining order against Kelly, claiming that she was stalking the family. The court threw it out because obviously there was no proof of that. So after these failed attempts, Kent went for a civil suit saying that Kelly locked their son outside of the school for 19 minutes on the day that he was late for pickup. Since this all failed, they then planted the stuff we talked about before and then they called the police and said that they saw someone driving erratically, which is now where we started the story. So the police searched her car, they searched her home, and they gave Kelly a field sobriety test. She passed the test and there was no signs of any of these kinds of substances anywhere else in her life. But on the substances, they did find DNA belonging to both of the Easters. Oh, what a surprise! Anyway, the case obviously went to trial, the Easters split up and both received jail time, and Kelly's name was officially cleared. I always knew that there was drama with parents at the same school, but I didn't realize just how much. In our number 7 spot today, we have Christopher Knight. Christopher is a person who is quite reclusive and he lived alone in the woods in Maine. He loved being alone and loved living a simple life, which definitely sounds fine enough, and it's said that, save for two brief interactions, he lived without human contact for 27 years from 1986 to 2013. I'm certainly not judging, I'm genuinely just wondering what that sort of a thing would do to a person. Here's where things get sort of unbelievable though. While living this totally secluded life, he was living in the woods of Maine, like I said before, but he was living in a small camp that he had set up that was kind of hidden from everyone because it was within a cluster of glacial erratic boulders. When he entered the woods, he had almost no possessions, which of course would make things difficult to survive, but he made a little home that was set up for himself out of entirely stolen items. That's right, this guy would go around to other camps and cabins nearby and steal their stuff, roughly 40 burglaries a year in order to continue on surviving while having no contact with anyone else. 
I guess the guy didn't really have any scary motives, but of course you absolutely cannot steal people's belongings. Eventually he was caught mid-burglary and he confessed to all of the other crimes and he did describe his understanding of how unethical his behavior was and it was determined he was very unlikely to reoffend. Christopher spent seven months in jail, he paid $2,000 in restitution, and he completed a court program and three years of probation. After his release, he went on to meet with a judge every week, he avoided alcohol, and he secured a job with his brother. There have been many articles written about Christopher's pretty fascinating story, and people are always trying to get to the bottom of why he lived his life like this. He's quite reluctant to share, but what he has said is, quote, solitude bestows an increase in something valuable. My perception. But when I applied my increased perception to myself, I lost my identity. There was no audience, no one to perform for. To put it romantically, I was completely free. In our number six spot today, we have Linda Riss. Okay, this is a story that actually has a movie that was made about it, so you know it's a wild one. Basically, Burt Pugak and Linda Riss basically fell in love at first sight in 1959. They were crazy for each other, and things seemed like complete paradise for the couple. Until Linda discovered that Burt was already married with children and that she called off the affair. This is when Burt turned into even more of a psycho, and he began to threaten Linda. He said, quote, if I can't have you, no one else will have you, and when I get through with you, no one else will want you. Bert needs to chill the heck out, but he did the exact opposite of that when he heard that Linda had gotten engaged to another man. He then paid three assailants to toss lie into Linda's face, which left her blind in one eye, nearly blind in the other, and with permanent scarring. Bert was convicted of the horrible crime and spent 14 years in prison, but while he was in there, he continually wrote letters to Linda. This story is already wild enough, but it does not end here. Upon his release from prison in 1974, Bert and Linda resumed their relationship. They co-wrote a book together about the whole ordeal as well, and legal troubles were not over for Bert, however, as he was again accused of being harmful to a woman that he was having an affair with, and Linda testified at his trial as a character witness for Bert. Imagine being a character witness for someone who did that to you. I'm not judging, I just do not understand. Anyway, Linda went on to live until 2013 and Bert passed away basically a year ago now on December 24th, 2020. Their story will certainly live on because it is very bizarre. In our number five spot today, we have the art scandal. This story takes place at a local coffee shop in Binghamton, New York. I don't know how to say that city. Sorry if I said it wrong. Basically, this shop started hanging colorful abstract paintings on its walls, and people visiting the shop began noticing and wanted to know who painted them and how much they could purchase them for. Well, the price was set to be around $253, and the artist? Three-year-old Marla Olmsted. This toddler quickly became a sensation in the media and she was creating pieces that were selling at auctions for like $6,000. It was absolutely insane. To make this story even more wild, there was controversy over the paintings and whether or not her parents had helped the child create them. Are you kidding? Who cares if the parents helped her? You're still paying thousands of dollars for a child's piece of art. Don't get me wrong, there's some talented kids out there, and getting a piece of art from a kid always makes your heart melt, but $6,000 worth of heart melting? I'm not so sure. Like the kids using Crayola paint. Anyway, do you think this was a case of a child prodigy, or were these people getting scammed? In our number four spot today, we have The Diamond Heist. So this story took place in 1940 during the Second World War and involves Colonel Montague, who is nicknamed Monty. So Monty was an undercover agent who was working with MI6, and when Germany began invading Amsterdam, Monty knew that they were going to try and go after some of the most valuable things, so instead of just waiting for them to be stolen, Monty decided to steal them first. You know, obviously to keep them safe. So basically, he somehow managed to get a key to the entrance of the Amsterdam diamond market. I don't know, I feel like everything about that should be a little more inconspicuous, but hey, it was the 1940s. Anyway, so he travels to the diamond place in just regular plain clothes, breaks in, but is it really breaking in if you have a key? 
I guess so because he wasn't supposed to have the key, but anyway, he breaks in, but he doesn't know the code to the vault. He thinks about past clues he's gathered to try and figure it out, and for 24 hours, this man works on getting into the safe. Literally, as he hears German forces around the building about to get in, he manages to get into the vault and complete his heist. He traveled with the diamonds all the way back to England before turning the valuables back over to the Dutch government. See what I mean? This could totally be a movie for sure. In our number 3 spot today we have Doug Scott. Despite all of the risks that come with mountain climbing, people love to do it. When out in the elements, in the wilderness, things can quickly go awry and when things are bad, it takes a different kind of person to somehow get through it and that is clearly seen in the story of Doug Scott. Doug was descending from a mountain that had been nicknamed the Ogre and something happened that caused him to break not one but both of his legs. As I'm sure you can imagine, that is something that would make things pretty difficult when it comes to mountain climbing. Doug simply was not about to just give up though. This man crawled on his hands and knees for days and he somehow managed to make it down off of the mountain alive. I talked about this story recently but I had to bring it back up for this video because I simply just cannot believe the strength and willpower that Doug showed. When asked how he managed to stay alive, Doug was all blasé about his insane survival skills and said, quote, It was no problem because I'd only broken both tibia. If I'd broken my femur, then I've no doubt I'd still be on that mountain. Doug could definitely have a movie made about him. In our number 2 spot today we have Sidney Riley. Sidney has a life story that is truly a movie waiting to happen. He was born in Odessa, Russia and was the son of a landowner and was brilliant right from the beginning. He was a talented linguist and learned how to speak over 7 languages while I'm over here struggling with one. When he was 19 years old he snuck onto a ship that was headed to Brazil as a little stowaway. Once in Brazil he took on a series of different regular jobs in order to make ends meet but one day as he was cooking for some British explorers, he was attacked. He managed to fend all of the people off himself and it managed to impress all of those around him. Basically, after witnessing his exceptional skill set, they all turned to him and said, Have you ever considered being a part of the Secret Service? Sidney then went on to spy training, and after this, he was sent back to Russia in order to collect information. He earned himself the nickname the Ace of Spies. There are rumors that he is actually the person who inspired Mr. Bond himself. In 1905, he tricked an oil concession holder into selling oil to Britain, which in the end really benefited Britain's future energy supplies. In the end, in 19 1925, Sydney was in Russia when he was finally caught and ended up being executed. There are so many things in stories about Sydney and his missions and all of the things that he did that there is definitely an action packed movie just waiting to be made about him. In our number one spot today, we have The Rescue. This is a story that a lot of us will probably remember because it happened just a few short years ago in June and July of 2018. Basically, on June 23rd of that year, 12 members of a Thai football team, all ranging in age from 11 to 16, and their 25 year old football coach entered a cave after a practice. Shortly after they entered, extremely heavy rainfall ended up flooding the cave and trapping all of the boys. For more than a week, no contact was made with the boys and it was uncertain exactly where they were or if they were still alive. The rescue efforts attracted attention from all over the world because this wasn't just any rescue effort. Because of the rain and the constant flooding, this required highly specialized and skilled cave divers, and there's not a ton of those hanging around. British divers John Valanthin and Richard Stanton volunteered their time and expertise, and on July 2nd, they were able to locate all of the missing boys alive. The problem, however, is that the group was about a four kilometer cave dive away from getting out, which provided a whole bunch of new risks, and the cave was only becoming more and more flooded as each day passed. There was so much that went into these rescues and it was so dangerous that a member of the Thai Navy SEALs, Saman Kunan, passed away during a rescue operation and another SEAL, Barut Pakbara, passed away in 2019 due to a blood infection that he contracted during the operations. In the end, all of the boys and their coach were miraculously saved after 18 days of being stranded thanks to a ton of volunteers who risked their lives to help. There's an absolutely fascinating, heart-wrenching, unbelievable documentary that was created by the incomparable adventure photographer and videographer Jimmy Chin, who also created Free Solo, if you've seen that, and it details the entire operation from beginning to end. It is called The Rescue, and I would highly, highly recommend it. It is honestly one of the most incredible things I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. 